Keeping podcast. How's I'm here with Kai again, and uh, we have a special guest today. Um, before we get into all that, let's just remember to thank the Morelia Python Radio Network for um, bringing this kind of material, these uh, different podcasts to us. Ours is one of them uh, for all the help and support they give us. And I want to remind you guys to, if you like reptile podcasts, you like monitors, and you have a few other interests, go ahead and go onto their website, Morelia Python Radio Network.net. Check out the other podcasts. They have some great guys on there talking about some really interesting information, whether it has to do with uh, reptile biology overall, snakes. You can learn a lot uh, by kind of crossing over and getting some more of that information there. Um, also like to um, point out people's attention. Uh, uh, my words are getting away from me, but go ahead and check on their Patreon and sign up and uh, help support these podcasts so we can bring more material to you. So other than that, uh, our guest today, Linnea, how are you? Hello, I am hey. fine. How are you? How's it going? I'm doing, doing all right. It's, uh, it's about midnight here in the U.S. for us. But <laughs> yeah, we're, what, we're in California right now, so um, essentially we're kind of taking our time out a little bit from our, our, our normal uh, scheduled program <laughs> to... Um, basically have uh, um, our time frame sort of match up as best as we can where, you know, it's still somewhat, uh, I mean, it's kind of like working hours for us, but it's a morning for her right now. Yeah, and it's where, nine where now. Are you, where are you at exactly? Sweden. Sweden? Sweden? Yeah. All right. Great. Now, um, to really get into the podcast, um, Linnea has been uh, – Someone I met maybe roughly around a year, a little longer than a year ago, maybe. Um, I, I honestly don't hit. remember. Yeah, uh, roughly around uh, the time. Well, I, I know the time and what happened was uh, her Savannah essentially laid a clutch um, really without uh, any breeding or much knowing what's going on and um, more of like a fluke, right? It just kind of yeah, happened. Yeah, I, I had until that point thought she was male because she had averted uh, her hemicliteri, but I thought they looked so big that I thought this must be hemipenes, so she must be a male. Yeah. And when I found her in a December morning, I saw her eating something, and I hadn't given her any food, and then I saw she was eating an egg, and I definitely had not given her any eggs. <laughs> And so I went into the enclosure, and I, I saw some uh, some white pearls in a corner under a uh, log. Nice. Yeah, so, um, you know, that's how we really got to uh, getting to know each other, and um, this, whole, this whole podcast is just going to be really dedicated to Savannah monitors and, uh, mm -hmm. and the keepers that, uh, that adore them and love them, and regardless of what people think about them and um, putting forth effort into mm -hmm. um, just expanding knowledge about them, um, kind of getting through some misconceptions and stuff like that, or just true understanding of what the animals can handle and what they, what they're like. Um, and so, you know, um, Linnea here has been able to not only be on the keeper aspect and the keeper side of things and, you know, the, the normal day to day, even as a breeder now, but she also has done some field work study. And so, you know, for us, I think even, even Alan and myself, we've, we've never done field sort of study, even right. though we're, we've been breeding for some time. And, um, you know, we've might've seen, or Alan has seen animals in the wild, but, um, I myself have never even left, um, left the United States. So, you know, um, having, uh, Having Linnea share her experience being out in the field in Africa, um, that man, that give us great insight. Um, you know, kind of going back a little bit, 
and or uh, more so of uh, pertaining to a similar subject, uh, Daniel Bennett, which a lot of us know, um, he was able to do a lot of field study and um, contribute an enormous amount to Savannah Care and um, just the whole overall aspect of keeping them and keeping them alive in captivity. But he himself wasn't really a keeper. He was just a biologist, a studier. Um, and so, you know, keeping them on a day-to-day -day basis is a little bit different, you know. And so mm -hmm. I, I want to kind of have people understand the wild aspect for this conversation and then also, you know, the breeding aspect later on as well. So, right. um, you know, as we get, as we dive right into this, uh, hope you guys enjoy the conversations and everything like that. Um, now, as far as, uh, as far as when you were over there or how, how long ago was that and how did that get started? Well, I went there in 2019 and I stayed there for about a week with three or four days of field work. And it started with me being on Facebook and chatting with Daniel Bennett. And he mentioned to me that he was going to go to a symposium in Denmark. And it was a symposium I had actually been thinking about going to, but they, uh, the ticket sales had closed before I knew if I would be able to go there or not. So I hadn't booked a ticket. And I told Daniel Bennett it was such a, such a shame because I had really wanted to see his lecture. And uh, he then said uh, he could get me in anyway, even though I hadn't booked a ticket in time. <laughs> nice. <laughs> but to, to keep it a bit secret. That's so, great, huh? Great, huh? Yeah, so I think it was just uh, two days ahead of the uh, symposium. I booked the train ticket and I decided to go there on a very short notice. And when I got there, I listened to his lecture and I got to see these photos and pictures of him in Africa with the Savannah monitors. And I spoke a bit to him during the breaks and he uh, said, if I really want to learn more about the Savannah Monitors, I should join him in his research and uh, go to Africa if I can. Mm -hmm. So that kind of made me realize it's, it's actually possible for a, a regular person if you have the money, of course, to go to Africa and just do it. Just do what you want to do. You don't need permission from anyone. You just need to get a visa and a plane ticket and you're ready to go. Now, I have a quick question for you. Were you already keeping Savannah monitors at this time? Yeah, I had uh, a group of four. Yeah, I had a group of four. Um, and I had, on the internet, I found so much conflicting information. Yeah. But the one source that did stand out as a credible, based on reality source was Daniel Bennett. Great. Now, with you had that group of uh, four already. Had you noticed any breeding behaviors um, prior to uh, going on that study? No, I had not. I, they were juveniles, I think, still. Um, nice. When I met with him. And as far as like, uh, like when you were there, um, what did you see mostly? I think I saw pictures of you with like measurements and stuff, but mm -hmm. did you get a chance to like see like adults and eggs mm -hmm. and, and nests and stuff like that as well? Or, or no, was not it during the short time I was there. No. Uh, we mostly found because it was uh, at the raining season and that's yeah. when the babies hatch. All right. So we found it was the transition period between the dry season 
when the adults are hidden up in the treetops and uh, when the babies hatch, like the transition between dry season and wet season. And, and do you remember just around what month this rainy season was in? It was in June. Okay. That's when I went there. So June for them, and essentially the few months prior to that is a dry season, right? Uh, yeah, but uh, I, I still it's still a bit confusing for me with the rain and dry season and them not having winters or summers over there. Yeah. So I need to <laughs> ask my friends who actually live there to ask, hey, what kind of season is it now? It's just less lush, right? Um, still, still pretty dense, but still, it's just less wet, right? During those oh. times. Oh, I haven't been during the dry season. Yet. Oh, okay. I've only been to Ghana once, so. Once it was raining and wet. Okay. Yeah. All right. Now, as far as like um, those 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 pictures that you showed me before, they were uh, they were measurements of just juveniles or sub adults, right? No, they were measurements of uh, babies that were almost freshly hatched. Like oh, just tiny. just freshly hatched. Yeah, like. Uh, as long as your finger in the body. Okay, line. so hatch, hatchling, hatchlings. Yeah. Nice. That's great. And now, um, do you that remember? That must have been like, incredible to see. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they were really it's kinda cute. Like, well. It's kind of like, you know, lifting your a rock and it's like, wow, it's just gold just shows up, you know? <laughs> There's some diamond or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's how I feel. Um, I mean, I've never experienced that, but... Um, just like herping itself, so I, I can see that's incredible. Now, um, I really want to kind of really, as much as I can, dissect just your surroundings. Not really the lizards now, you know, but um, you know, going back and relating to the weather um, and your your rainy season. Mm -hmm. um, Australian monitors and Indonesian monitors, they're they're. On the primary of what we normally breed, um, you know, and the Indonesian species are even a little bit tougher than some of the Australian species. And not to not to say that Australian species are easy; it's just the the the, the amount of people breeding them are are a little bit um, just higher, you know. Yeah. And so, um, the African species really maybe white throats are much more readily bred. Um, black throats would be right underneath those guys. And then, you know, savannas are like like yours or a couple people prior to you. Just um, first happens as flukes until you really get the gears going, you know. Yeah. Um, and then now monitors like rarely ever, maybe yeah. I've ever only heard of one instance. And so right. um, what I want to get into is just the fact of African species are a little bit different. I, I just understanding other keepers and um learning how they're keeping their white throats and stuff like that um they're allowing their animals to go through a certain seasonal period change rather than um just heat them and feed them you mm -hmm. know um my friend dave uh, 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 uh dave urbanowix who does white throats and he also has a few other monitors as well um man he's he was helping me understand just how he did his white throats and that helped me do my mangroves and then i was able to help you do your savannas um so you know it's uh, it's kind of like all intertwined um just about how how we do things and i want to get people to also understand just the flow of stuff um getting into natural weather and change and what triggers the animals to breed and then getting into breeding you know i'm like all of that is kind of intertwined and it'll all overlap um and so you know maybe we can kind of go through just like man more of like the soil or what you what you would not normally take in you know as uh, as you're going out herping because you're looking for animals but i mean can you describe just like the the temperature of the day or can you describe like the actual scenery as well yeah um, so we could start with the humidity in the country um, as soon as i landed in the capital of ghana 
and I walked outside the airport. It was like walking into a wall of water. It's like walking into the shower after someone has been taking a very hot shower for one hour, and it's just <laughs> super steamy. Wow. Okay. So Great. the humidity was really high when I was there during the uh, transition to the rain season. And uh, when we went looking for the savannah monitors, we went to the countryside to where people grow crops and where they have cattle. And we went into these crop fields where they grow cassava and they grow uh, pepper, chili pepper, and some other stuff. And the whole area, it was uh, very green, except possibly around the chili plants, the pepper plants, because they had, they were basically growing out of dried mud, it mm. looked like. Uh, so there was no grass underneath the, the chili plants. It was just the chili plants sticking them out through the ground. But all the other crops had a lot of grass, and uh, lush, veget lush under vegetation, uh, like, yeah, a lot of grass. And there was some trees, but they weren't very tall. They were kind of maybe four or five meters tall at most, scattered around. The, the nim tree, it's native to India, I think, but it's been imported to Africa. And the uh, when I was there, it was a bit cloudy, but there was a bit of sun as well. But it wasn't too warm. It was rather pleasant temperature for me. About maybe 27 to 30 Celsius or something, air temperature. I don't remember the exact readings. So. No worries, that's okay. It's yeah, we're just, just a, trying just to get an idea. idea. Just an right. idea. Yeah. Now, we weren't um, there, so we're trying to get you know what mm -hmm. we can from your experience <laughs> for right. us and the listeners. That, that dense humidity, it's kind of like what we talk about when we open our own cages and it just slaps you in the face. Yeah. Kind of what you just described. So that's, that's good to know. Um, now, was, I mean, really get, in, get into the dirt here, um, pun intended, I guess. Uh, what was the soil like? Uh, the soil, it's uh, sandy, but so it's, uh, it's like sand mixed with dirt or mixed with mud and it's really nice for holding burrow shapes uh, you could see the burrows from rats lizards and insects and the uh, like the shape of it was uh, very clear like it was usually very smooth and it was extra smooth if it was a lizard who made it rather than a rat Wow. Hmm. Nice. And so, so did you know which holes to go uh, looking in just based off the burrows? I did not know it, but um, the people I were there with, the locals, and uh, another friend who's not exactly local to the area, but he's uh, native to the country, uh, they told me about the shapes of the burrow and the smoothness. Uh, tells you what kind of animal has been inside. So if it's round and very smooth, it's probably a lizard. And if it's like rectangular, it's most likely a scorpion. Hmm. And if it's round but rough, then it's likely a rat or a mouse. That's fascinating. That's cool. <laughs> Just the very small details these guys are picking up out there yeah. and are they uh are they kind of like harassing the little holes and tubes and shoving little twigs in there and stuff or no um, what we or... did is we used uh, sort of like a mining pick and a uh, cutlass uh, 
a blunt end cutlass to dig uh, through the hole and because the animals were hidden inside these holes, uh, maybe 40 or 30 centimeters into the hole. Okay, so okay. we would dig the animals up and then we'd take uh, the measurements and weigh them. And if, if we had any crickets, because there's giant burrowing crickets in the area, uh, we would try to feed them one of the crickets before uh, letting them run off. Because mm -hmm. the crickets are a pest to these crops. Mm -hmm. But um, in some areas, the villagers think that the lizards are the ones causing the crops to go bad when it's actually the crickets that the lizards are attracted to. Yeah. So some people, when they see the monitors, they will kill it because they think it leads to uh, rotting crops. But what we, we wanted to film and record them eating crickets so we could show people, hey, they're not poisoning your crops or eating their crops. They're actually eating the crickets, causing you problems. So if you let the lizards stay alive, you'll have less problems. Yeah. Mm. Well, nice. It's a, a little agricultural help as well yeah. with all that. That's good. Now, uh, man, getting into... Getting getting into the 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 captives that or the ones that you were able to catch, how, mm -hmm. how many how many were there were there a, like a bunch or just a hand, small handful? Oh, I don't remember that exactly either. But uh, say maybe we caught ten or so in a day, maybe. Oh, okay. well, in a day, so in a day, yeah. that's pretty good. Yeah. Well, I, I don't know what it is, but 15. I don't. It was. Two years ago, so yeah, that's fine. But um, both the locals and Daniel Bennett on the phone told me that when they went there twenty years ago, what I found in one hour, what I found in one day, they would find in one hour. One hour. Oh, wow. So yeah. um, the population seems to have been declining over the years. Hmm. Yeah, just they, like with, with everything. Yeah, so they yeah. they found they found them pretty much everywhere, several all the time. But when I was there, I didn't find as many as they did. Man, and you had That's mentioned it. earlier about finding animals in the treetops. Uh, no, did you find? But oh, uh, you... The, the animals we know the adults are hidden in the treetops. Okay. Uh, because other people have found them there during the dry season, but I personally haven't. I see. Okay. But that's the, the, the adults. Uh, but 20 years ago, when they were finding the juveniles, they would find maybe 10 times the numbers I found when I was there. Okay. Yeah, just, just hundreds and hundreds, huh? Just... Yeah. Like uh, like uh, finding little blue bellies along the fence or something like that. You know? <laughs> For uh, us, yeah. A ton of little lizards. It's kind of it's kind of amazing though. Um, to to hear or see about, I mean, lizards. When we hear about them here, other than the keepers, um, you hear a lot of bad news about them. But man, to hear them like like that flourishing or doing really, I mean, not not numbers fifty to hundred years ago, but you know, just to see them scattered out while you're out in the country where they're from, it's, it's amazing. Yeah. And um, when you're, I guess, or do you have plans to go back now that you have even yes. um, extended your study with uh, with breeding them and seeing what, what else you can do? Yeah, I plan to go back to Ghana to the same area. I was actually going to go there last year, but then Corona came, so I yeah. didn't want to be traveling during those times. I'm hoping to go there this year, and I'm hoping to get vaccinated before I go, because I don't want to bring any disease to them. And also, I really don't like being sick, yeah. <laughs> and I also don't want to have to quarantine when I arrive, so I'd rather get vaccinated before I go. 
And do you have some of the same contacts that you'll be meeting up with there? Yeah. Uh, is, okay. Nice. Awesome. Now, uh, yeah, now, I, I, don't, uh, I don't know the local languages, so I need someone who does. Yeah. Sadly, we don't have Daniel Bennett anymore. Um, yeah. Like if uh, any of the new keepers or anybody just not knowing Daniel Bennett, I know I mentioned this a little bit before, but um, just a gr like godfather to Savannah monitors or uh, monitors in general. Um, I mean, and as, and as far as our community, what he stands out as is um, the, the gentleman bringing the, the information that makes you think mm -hmm. um, is really drawing new um, new ideas out, um, keeping the animals alive longer because Savannah monitors were really coming in and imported. And, you know, it's the dollar amount put on them um, adds to people not really giving a care about them and stuff like that. It just adds to the demise of these animals. And so you see a lot of them just be discarded off and, um, you know, just not really make it to success and not really thrive in captivity. And so Daniel Bennett basically, you know, put it in a lot of people's ears and a lot of people's eyes and giving them ideas to just uh, keep these animals better. Um, and so you'll hear this name periodically throughout the episode uh, quite a bit. Um, and you may hear us bring him up um, just in general as far as, you know, contributions on why we do things and helping out and such like that. Um, now, I guess getting back into your uh, your experience there, and um, now now breeding them, um, have you been able to take what you've gathered there and utilize it in your in your current setup and and what you've got going on now? I have tried um, last year in the first half of the year. I tried to simulate the dry season. So I stopped misting the enclosures. I reduced feeding. I removed their swimming feature, so they just had a water bowl to drink from instead. And then eventually I would periodically empty the water bowl and let it sit empty for maybe two or three days before filling it. And then eventually removing the water bowl uh, completely for maybe a week at a time. Mm -hmm. And this is to simulate the dry yeah. season, right? Okay. Yeah, for my uh, then uh, juveniles or subadults. All right. Now, I know you and I have gone over this quite a bit, but um, do you mind just uh, letting people know kind of the time frame that it took – your just your dry period prior to revamping and going up again but you know how you're going down for a couple months or so yeah you want to um, kind of go over that a little bit yeah like the transition from having a full swimming feature a full water bowl and uh, misting uh, regularly the transition to doing none of that was maybe one or two months and then I I keep it like that with uh, basically very little super little water access for maybe three months or something the first time I did it and then uh, I uh, I gave them access to water to drink, but I didn't give them a swimming feature or started misting again until uh, maybe two months after that. Okay. So the drop period for them and then the the steady low, or the, mm -hmm. essentially what it is, is uh, we've talked about this before where it's kind of like our maintenance period or our, our, our neglect, we, we jokingly yeah. call it the neglecting period where mm -hmm. we're essentially feeding mm -hmm. them less, watering them less. Yeah. Um, and this takes down uh, the, the extra fat and anything like that that they have, kind of utilizes it, um, portionalizes it a well. And then these animals kind of go, you know, they're hungry. 
so they don't have a whole lot in them and then her her period of just a couple months um to being down and it's not two full months you, you kind of gradually go down in one month and then maybe a good month month and a half of sitting at that low level of not really doing much and then another couple weeks or roughly a month of going back up um and so this whole time frame can be uh, a few months long all, all all in total just the whole down steady and then going back up um i did it for about half a year in total so maybe two or three months after the steady of nothing wow well, hmm. so that's, that's that's amazing that's um, just for what they can go through, uh, people yeah. you know think they just need to eat and eat and eat and eat. But right. we're we're trying to just do something different. It's not that it's the right way or something like that. It's just well, obviously those weren't working. Um, and not to discredit the heat them and feed them type deal, but that don't get me wrong, that does work on some animals, but it just doesn't work on all of them. And so if you know if you just kept on heating and feeding them these things wouldn't really produce but taking them down and then bringing them back up giving them fat and um and essentially a good proteins and uh, nutrients to be able to produce eggs um that sends the body into like oh all right now my body has reserves to do this you know mm -hmm. now as far as getting back up um when what month do you think that was or how many months mm. after the dry part mm. oh i don't mm. remember fully because i it was just about the time i found out i had to move apartments so i had to well that uh, sounds so, like fun <laughs> yeah so because i didn't want to deal with uh wet substrate because it gets super heavy yeah i uh I think I that was in August, if I remember. Yeah, right. that's when that's when I m did move. But I found out about the move in about April or so. So uh, I did a very slow transition back, just because I didn't want to deal with. Oh, the... that's that was it. So what we what what I remember is, if you m moved with the full on getting back into um, breeding, right, and if you were to do that, you'd have breeding while you're moving. Yeah, and that's also one of the reasons I didn't yeah. want to. Uh, yeah. So increase what you did was too much before moving because I didn't want to move with a female carrying yeah. eggs. Eggs, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so what you did was instead of the normal few months, you extended it longer until yeah. after your move period. Yeah. Which is crazy. Oh, it's yeah. it's it's nuts because you would think, all right, you know, I gotta. It's now time. I have to do this because it's time, but you mm -hmm. even made them wait longer. So yeah. that's am that's amazing. Yeah. And I want to go back to what you said about uh, utilizing fat during this uh, dry season, this fasting period. Mama do sis in, I think it was Senegal in the 70s. He did some kind of study. I don't have direct at direct access to his text because they're in French and I don't speak French. But from what Daniel has written about his work, he said that Mamadou Sis, he investigated the fat bodies, uh, the big lumps of fat in the abdomen of savanna monitors, um, how it correlates to the dry season. And he found out just before the dry season starts, the fat content is about 4% of their body weight. And at the end, like six months later, it's 2% of the body weight. Mm -hmm. um, and he also cut up some uh, males, removed the fat bodies from them, so they, they, the fat bodies were completely gone. They had only the fat in the uh, muscle tissues and the tail left. And they survived the dry season. Mm. But uh, another thing Mamadou found out was that 
during the dry season, the testes, the testicles of the males, they shrink. Mm. And uh, when it gets back to rain season, they uh, go back to normal again. But for the males who had the fat bodies removed, the testicles did not go back to normal. So the fat bodies in the abdomen, the lumps of fat, they play a role for uh, when it comes back to restoring the body to its normal state uh, once wet season starts. Okay. Interesting. I, I had never heard that before. So, um, I, It's quite amazing how even if you cut out the big lumps of uh, fat, like the largest lump, which is in the abdomen, which on wild specimens aren't that big because they're wild. But if, if you cut the fat out, they're still able to survive this fasting period. Hmm. Wow. Now, with that, so from what I gather, um, that was an extent. It was, I, I'm thinking about eight months or so that you kind of had them in a transition phase, both beginning in the dry period and coming out of it. It was a one month transition into it and then uh -huh. a few months to get out of it. But they were in full dry season for a few months as well. So, But in total, uh, transition into it, the actual dry season and then the transition out is about eight months when I did it last year. Interesting. Just, just because I had to move and I didn't want to deal with the heavy substrate. Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing, though. Uh, you know, it's funny, those little things sometimes, uh, the necessities that we have to do ourselves, uh, you have to figure out how to make something work, and you see what kind of effect it can have on your animals sometimes. It's funny how many little stories I've heard like that where it caused someone to do things a little different and uh, then notice success where they weren't having success before. Um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's weird. It's interesting. <laughs> Now, um, getting into where we are now, um, I want to congratulate you for hatching your first clutch of Savannah monitors. Absolutely. We, wow. are, we are in the middle of her first clutch hatching. Yeah. So um, she's basically living in cloud nine right now. Yeah. Um, and um, this is amazing experience. Um, okay. Not just is it amazing because it's Savannah monitors or, um, you know, the fact that they're rarely done, but it's it's amazing that we got to walk through this process. Not not often, you know, are you seeing success, and then whenever you see success, they're flukes or the person may not want to tell you or they they don't even they can't tell you because nothing was really calculated nothing was written down it was just it just happened you know um and so what we what we have now is data we have for sure information and tested tried and true efforts that are working um you know it hasn't really been many clutches or I would say I, I still consider just the first couple clutches to be more of like luck. But once you kind of get into it more and more, it's, you know, then, then you, then you really got it down. But, um, you know, are seeing now you're into your possible third clutch. Yeah. She is super big and uh, she made it about, almost a month ago and mated for a full day and then two days after that she also mated for uh, several hours and and so she you're hatching your first clutch right now yeah. and she's uh, possibly going to be laying her third clutch yeah. and she's basically on her if she's already double clutched within mm -hmm. within what a 60 day period right uh, yeah, I think it was something like that, yeah. Wow. 40, 45 days. I, I don't remember the exact number. She did, she laid. But it was, it was fast, though. Yeah, right? yeah, fast, very fast. <laughs> it was fast, okay. Um, and so now this female, 
and you're going by behavior. You know, I don't want to take yeah. this from you at all. Uh, and this is still your seat, but um, you know, what, what what were those behaviors that you saw from your pair? Uh, she is kept alone at all times of the year, except for mating, because if she sees another monitor, she will rush at them and bite them and shake them and be, in general, not very nice. Hmm. Uh, so I have to keep her completely alone, except during breeding. And, and is she different during breeding season? Yeah, it, when she is in the mood for mating, she is super, super nice. <laughs> she she doesn't hiss. She doesn't do the head twitch. She doesn't uh, feel herself with air to look bigger or anything. She doesn't tail whip. She she just uh, tongue flicks them, and looks like she thinks they're okay. Hmm. And uh, it's crazy. After yes. she has mated, and if the male if the male is sleeping somewhere, she'll walk up to him and she'll sleep right next to him. That's the cuddle part after yeah. mating. Yeah, <clears throat> that's uh, recognized by many species um, to do that. A monitor, a monitor is just to have that post cuddle after after mating. Yeah. It's <laughs> kind of now, um, all right. I know people can't really see, which uh, sadly, sorry, you guys listening, but um, this dedicated this dedicated keeper literally is ha like you can see the setup right behind her chair yeah. right now, and um, it's a it's a great setup. It's just a big greenhouse in the room and fully decked out. Um, to kind of describe it, it's a big greenhouse. You can walk into this thing, and then it has a big cage inside of it that stores that's where the male is or your female no that's where one of the males is because what? he too is a bit aggressive just like my female and okay. he uh, stopped being nice to the other males so okay. he's kept uh, a bit separate but he still has the same temperature humidity the same air as the other males the same air because he's, it's he's a like... mesh cage it's a big mesh cage inside the greenhouse. Yeah, and the top looking. of the mesh cage is plywood. Uh -huh. So that uh, plywood top is used as a basking platform for the other males. Okay. And um, all right. Now, okay, getting into ideas, because um, I don't really do this a lot yet. I really kind of wait for either waiting for vitiligenesis or... I'm waiting to. I already have them paired, so they once the female gets into gear, they just mate. But mm -hmm. I have aggressive animals as well, and um, mine are always kind of you know tearing into each other. And to be honest, I it's hard to pick up on on too many details. I think just because they're so frantic. So I mm -hmm. want to get them at a at 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 their comfortable stage and then showing me signs. Do you guys get what I'm saying? Yeah. And I don't want to, I don't want to have to confuse what I'm right now is I'm confusing or I have so much to take in that I'm confusing their frantic behavior towards me as well as their frantic behavior towards each other when I introduce them. So what I'm trying to adopt now is the actual cage within a cage or more so of a partition somehow mm -hmm. inside my current cages for for my aggressive animals. I do have nice pairs and I do have decent non-aggressive females and some males that are not aren't too bad, but I also have some that are just they're no go. I've bred them before so I know that they're okay to breed. It's just they're just so aggressive sometimes and the immediate response when I introduce them is just the to bite and to lacerate not just to not just to test bite or to slightly dominate but to literally hurt and kill yeah. um and so what i want to do is what you're kind of doing now mm -hmm. um is to take this idea where i think they get to smell each other feel each other um alan i think we were talking about this the other the other night um where i was going to be using some hardwire cloth in between these partitions right and um just got to find the right gauge. I got a 16 gauge and I believe uh, each, each little space in between is three fourths or one inch almost. 
So, you know, they're not rubbing their noses. Hopefully, they're not rubbing their noses against this. Um, now, uh, when you use yours, do you have a problem with them ripping out their nails? I have had uh, one of them ripped out the nail as a baby with a okay. completely different mesh. So, oh, okay. this mesh I have for um, the separate nail. Yeah. It's uh, maybe one centimeter by one centimeter. Uh, so he can fit through his entire toes, but he can't fit through his hand. Because okay. if they would bite each other through the mesh, no, I would rather have them lose a toe than an entire hand. Mm -hmm. yeah. But they haven't uh, bitten off any toe so far. But, I think it's just uh, amazing, yeah. the whole cage inside of a cage. Yeah. And how but you have in the greenhouse, it. it's not where I keep my female. I, my female is completely separate, another enclosure a few meters away. In my greenhouse, I keep three males, two of them together, cohabbing quite nicely. Like, they might do some dominance, but it ne they, they never bite each other, never, these two males. They'll, at most, do some wrestling. But they never bite each other, and that's super nice. You know, like, and that's, that's, uh, that's, that's really cool, because... Um, I mean, there's like two sides to that because some, you know, me, I've seen where my males will rip each other apart, mm -hmm. <laughs> but, um, you know, there's, um, there's males out there that just do the ritual combat and that's it. Yeah. And that's, I, I kind of think that's cool. Cause I mean, that's great. Cause they don't fight each other and kill. I mean, they're not like killing each other and they're just sticking to the script, yeah. you know, but, but the ones that are trying to like just murder each other, man. Yeah. Those are the those are the headaches. Yeah. I'm pretty yeah. lucky. I don't I don't have to deal with any animals like that. And so uh not yet anyway. I'm sure it's in the future at some point with this whole hobby, but right now everybody gets along so nicely. So <laughs> Yeah, I'd, I'd like to what I'd like to do is just read behavior better. Um you know, my my animals just kind of tuck away and hide so much. So I really uh I I've, I've had to change some setups up a little bit. Uh, adopt what you kind of have as well. It's mm -hmm. yours is just the cage platforms on platforms, and that's yeah. kind of what I did with mine. I took out, I took out all my big, huge logs mm -hmm. that I had in there, and those logs were good usage for them hiding a little bit. But man, they would just hide so much, so I'd never see them, and uh, also never see behavior as well. But mm -hmm. now that I have them. A little bit more exposed kind of like platforms like that basically build up where um it's uh, off the ground leveled up more gives them more area to 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 hang out on um and uh gives me a better look at how i'm how i'm hoping to see their their behavior towards each other you know um so yeah I've, i haven't implemented it a hundred percent yet I have done it for a couple pairs, but not everybody has their hides taken away yet just because I didn't want to do that to everybody. I just wanted to do it to the specific animals that are so frantic, you know. Yeah. Um, that's it, yeah. So and you uh, they... force them a bit to be exposed to you. Yeah. That's so that they'll, uh, they'll uh, lose their fear through exposure to you. Yeah. Can you describe uh, the the vertical amount of space that you allow your animals? I mean, I can see it, but for the listeners, um, what are you allowing your animals to have? Because a lot of times we think about savannah monitors and we think they are dirt monitors. But yeah. you, you are but giving the, some vertical abilities yeah. inside your cage. Yeah, the, the, the mesh cage uh, with the bolstering platform on top, it's maybe one and a half meters high so uh i think that's like five, Four feet. five feet yeah and they'll climb to the top of that and then they want to climb even higher <laughs> yeah yeah and so in the wild and most people think savannah monitors are yeah like they're just you know rock crevice to uh, low land animals but people are finding them how many meters up there I don't know any exact, but you can find the adults in the in the treetops. 
like tree tops. So that's 20, 30 feet up there. It, that depends on what kind of trees. Because tree? uh, okay. uh, in the farmland where I went, the trees were maybe five meters high at most. Okay. Five, five meters high? So that's yeah. still that's, that's still a good amount. amount. That's still a good amount. Yeah. And it's, it's definitely not. When they it's go definitely up. not like a shoulder length or shoulder height or or waist yeah they, they go higher than shoulders yeah, much much <laughs> higher so and 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 that's that's great to know because you know i think a lot of people just really think that the savannas are desert sand little lizards and yeah, it's a and fit, but yeah much much more much more complex to their setup um and that's yeah. goes for a, a lot of monitors um during many stages of their lives or completely um, you know, just utilizing trees and living in cork hollows and things like that. And uh, what's so? Oh, I'm interrupting. No, Go ahead, Kyle. No, no. Yeah. Um, I think um, just the last point on uh, the home tree. I, I I don't know how 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 much this exists for for many um, many animals, but I, I think it exists for for a lot of uh, a lot of species, birds and. And things return to a certain tree that they they might have come from or hatched under or um, is within their their normal range. And this this tree is basically, you know, their their home. Um, yeah, it's a so the large dead par partially dead tree that's still up, you know. And um, many animals use utilize it. Sorry, man, what were you saying? Oh, I, I just wanted. I just wanted to know about uh, the the females enclosure, but now you got my mind thinking about these uh, home trees. So, <laughs> yeah, uh, you know what, Linnea, you just tell me what what uh, you know, what do you think about these trees? What do you offer for your uh, your animals um, as far as that home base to replicate something like that in your own enclosures? In the greenhouse, we have the basking platform. And uh, in, along one of the cool sides of the basking platform, they have a big hollow cork tube. And it's one of their favorite heights. I don't know if it's the height or if it's the heat or if mm -hmm. it's just the, the shape of the cork tube. But they really like that one. And that's where I almost always find at least one of them sleeping. And in the female's enclosure, I have another cork tube uh, arranged vertically. So it's, it's like a tree inside the enclosure, but a very short tree, and it's hollow. And she, she uses it as a sort of tower. She'll poke her head out through the opening at the top and yeah. just stay there looking at everything, observing everything from uh, inside her cork tube tree. And if she spots anything interesting like food, she'll come out. Oh, nice. <laughs> she watches you all day, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> Except Thank when you. she's pregnant, like now, I think it's maybe a bit too cramped for her. Mm. <laughs> yeah, does she do a vertical hanging or belly, belly placement hanging where she's kind of uh, um, positioned in a weird way and and like her belly is distended and she's trying to just alle uh, alleviate some of the pressure in her belly? Well, it's kind of hard to say because her enclosure is filled with all kinds of rubble everywhere. Every square inch of the surface, it has branches and logs and all kinds of uh, weird angles. But she never really just hangs on the outside of her tree when she's gravid. But when she is outside the tree when she's resting and basking she will when grab it often re rest with the front half of her body raised a little bit compared to the lower part mm -hmm. nice now for, as far as the uh the breeding that you witness now you said the the male is um or, or the pair are very cordial to each other. Uh, what? When do you take the male out? I take the male out when I notice the female is uh, starting to get dominant towards him. Okay. So you're watching behavior the whole time. Yeah. They're giving you the cues to read. 
Yeah. And you just. And if she that. starts being dominant, I'll keep them in there uh, for maybe one or two days more, to just to see if it was just a temporary thing, her dominance, or if she stays consistently becoming more and more dominant, because then I have to remove him for his safety. Okay. They are both the same size, but she is super aggressive and will escalate to biting very quickly. Wow. For his safety. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He, he, on the other hand, he's one of the males I, the one I co-have with the other male. He never bites, never. And he is a, he's a very nice to uh, uh, introduce to other monitors because I know he will not bite them. Yeah, there's like people say um, that the 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 worry is the male. No, the worry is the female. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I've had some pretty pretty uh, pretty rough females, man. They're uh, they're they're not uh, um, in, in and around nesting or when they've claimed the nest and it's they've used it or you know it's time to lay or getting in and around that man my males couldn't even go near it without getting ran off um so it's it, it's uh it's great practice for me to remove my males roughly set if the male can get it done and and i think they're done um within a couple of days then i'll remove them in two or three days but typically seven to ten days is how i is what i leave the male and i noticed to start i started to sorry i start to notice their their um separation or they're no longer just coupled you know mm -hmm. um, that week mark 10 day mark after their breeding because breeding is, is can go for days and days and days um if you uh, you know if you're really uh watching them to the start and from the end and kind of their post cuddling it, it it can last a few days almost up to two weeks um but I, I typically always remove the male just for his safety because he's going to want to go around the, the nest bin or he's going to be a, an intruder, try to dig up eggs. And I'm worried about that, too. Yeah. You know, him digging up eggs and then him, her killing him for sure, you know, um, something like that. That's, that's what I definitely want to avoid. Um, so, yeah. Uh, now, you, with your, uh, your current um, – your, your current – four a group of four right are you are you rot rotating males or it's just those other two males are, aren't really compatible with her uh, it's just uh i was planning to rotate the males but i i wasn't expecting her to cycle a second and a third time yeah so that, uh, what i did is uh, I, because because i know he is so nice when i started noticing um behavior in her that makes me think she is ready to mate. I took him out of his enclosure and I hold him out on my arm and I stick my arm into her enclosure and see how she reacts. Hmm. And uh, then I let him go and I continue observing and then he just locked up with her. That's her thing, yeah. And I want, uh, and si since he already locked up with her, I didn't want to change male because if any of the people who buy the babies from me want to continue breeding the babies, I want them to know the uh, pedigree with as much ac accuracy as possible. So I want them to know exactly who the father is. So if they want to cross genes, they yeah. can do it. And if they don't want to, they can not do it. Yeah. Now, are they breeding out in the open, for the most uh, part? No, I, I put her, I put him into her enclosure, so they bred in her enclosure. But this third time, I had actually put her into the male's enclosure, and I swapped one of the males that hadn't bred with her into her enclosure. Okay. Um, and then I found them uh, mating inside the greenhouse. And what, and I, what I, I, I think I meant was um, are when they are copulating, uh, are they visible out in the open or do they usually retreat uh, to the corner of the, the cage? No, they're, they're out in the open. Okay. But my, my monitors, they see me 24-7. So 
So I'm I'm not a threat to them. They don't care about my movements at all. Right. Very understandable. And, now, if you have someone over, have you noticed the animals act different to someone they're not used to seeing? No, not really. Oh, awesome. Very cool. I have a few that will, and I have a few that just don't care who's in there. They're out all the time. But I have noticed for a few people, uh, sometimes I'll bring my my kids around, and some of the animals don't like seeing short people. And I don't know (laughs) what that's about, but uh, they don't trust them. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. um, Can you describe maybe your your female's uh, nesting area? Do you use whole cage nesting for her or do you use nest boxes? I use uh, nest boxes, but uh, the first touch, she completely ignored her nest bin. She didn't touch it at all. And uh, she instead dug under some of the rubble under a basking area and laid 44 eggs under there in the Mm -hmm. substrate. And then she covered them up for, took her several hours, like uh, half a day or something, to just cover up the eggs. And the second clutch, she... um, 44. Yeah, 44. (laughs) Yo, that's... I I mean, out of a monitor lizard? Yeah. So... These eggs are, I would say, ping pong ball size or a yeah. little smaller, right? Right yeah, around ping pong ball size. So they're not, they're not for for a four foot lizard. Your female is four foot. My female, it's uh, about a meter. Three, three to four, less okay, than so four, but more than three. So, so roughly a meter, right? This is this is a pretty decent size lizard. She, she is uh, roughly about eighty centimeters, I think. Okay, okay, so now these egg sizes. Now my mangrove female, one of my females, is only two feet. Mm-hmm. So that's not even a meter, right? Yeah. The savanna is a meter. But the savanna is laying four, 44 ping pong ball size eggs. Now my one of my, my mangroves lays each clutch maybe only three to five eggs, but each egg is three inches. Mm-hmm. So that's, I would say... Um, I'm trying to, in, in size comparison, trying to compare it to something, but, um, man, I mean, you, if you, if you, I mean, you can just take your finger's length and, you know, double it. That's roughly around the size of each of my Indicus eggs. Um, and so, you know, it's a, it's a pretty, pretty vast difference, you know, yeah. and she's got so many eggs, but they're smaller. My my mangroves have so few eggs, but they're they're huge mm-hmm. compared in comparison. The lizards are m- much different sizes, and uh, African species are known to have huge clutches compared yeah. to all the monitors. Yeah. Huge clutches, um, you know, black throats, white throats, and I think even Niles um, have, yeah. have pretty decent clutches compared to, you know, Australians dozen or some of the. Um, you know, the endo species that only have like two or three or five at the max, maybe eight. Um, you know, it's 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 kind of crazy to see what you're going through with your current animals. Um, now that you're on to possible clutch three. Mm-hmm. Um, now, going into just where you started several months ago and then now. Um, do you think, do you think you're following the right, the right movements as your as, as far as like your animals momentum and breeding and, and as far as what you're thinking is doing is correct and all that stuff like that? Um, you know, how, how do you feel about what you're currently going through? Well, I had planned for her to only had only have one clutch. So this uh, second and third came as a bit of a surprise. Especially yeah. that she was ready to breed a third time, because I only fed her twice after she laid the second clutch. Wow! Before she mated again for the third. But because I was hoping to uh, try the uh, dry season again this year, yeah. but because she was gravid, I had to delay that, and then she got gravid again, and now she's mm-hmm. gravid for a third time. 
again. So, yeah. yeah, so it's not going exactly as I planned. But if uh, her body is telling her that, okay, this is what we're going to do now, then I, I, I think her body is making the, the right decisions based on the conditions. Yeah, that's what I'm scared of too, to just think that they know what to do as well and then like, oh man, I kind of pushed you too far. I'm um, kind of going, <laughs> currently going through that with one of my Kimberly Rocks right now. Um, she's on clutch number four or five since January, right? And we're into April now and um, I want her to stop. <laughs> I really just to, to like hey just just chill out like you don't have to keep dropping stuff so she laid one i i i basically was going to tell myself you know you don't want to push your kimberly's too much they tell you not to push them too much so um you know obviously this is my also my pet so i don't want to kill her um and so she laid one clutch and then i took the mail out kept the female separate didn't even feed her a lot and then she just dropped another clutch of infertiles and then instead of having her go through infertiles i put a mail with her thank yeah. you alan for that mail as well um no worries and uh, i basically put this mail with her and bam like uh, within 15 18 days uh good clutch and then again right after that 18 to 20 days another clutch and so um I was just amazed. It's like, all right. And then now, she, even though um, she's bounced back a little bit, she's eating, uh, I just don't want to do it to her again. And so I don't know um, how to stop it other than to not feed them, but I have to recoup her. So it's like the recouping period, and she's also just using that to utilize uh, utilize that for eggs, eggs and uh. stuff again. And it just seems like uh, what well, you're going through, the same thing with your savannas. Uh. Um, I – to be honest, don't know what to do. So, like, <laughs> as far as as far as keeping them going or not, you're, mm -hmm. we're we're pushing the limit essentially, as far as what we know, you know. Um, and that's great. I really, I'm really glad that you're able to share that part with us mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. I've been How wondering if maybe if we feed them too much when they're gravid, that they might. They, yeah, they might get some fat from it, uh, and then they'll use that fat to start producing the next clutch. So I think if you feed them uh, very much when they're gravid, that might yeah. be a cause for double or triple clutching, even if you don't feed them very much after, like after the second clutch. I fed her yeah. twice. She still cycled again. Yeah. But we don't know we need to do some research but it's just right. just an more, idea. Study, more studies with numbers but it's a an idea to keep in our heads because um you know we obviously want the best for animals still breed but not over push it and things like that um ellen what, what did you have to say sorry bro oh i'm just wondering if uh that knowing that your animal is capable of uh double clutching triple clutching do you think that's something that is actually going on in the wild right now that these animals are doing? Well, I have been thinking about it because uh, in the wild, you'll find the earliest babies hatching around February. But then in June, uh, in the, at the expos here, you can mm -hmm. still find hatch like, like super fresh hatchling size savannah monsters for sale and that's yeah. a huge period of like four months that you'll still be able to find hatchling sized babies for sale at expos and I'm wondering because uh, Daniel Bennett and my friend Tony says they have found savannah monitors mating at the shift of uh, November, December, but if you look at the incubation period of the, the few clutches we've had in captivity, we're like looking at 120 to 150 days of incubation. Four to five months, roughly. Yeah, so if, if they mate in uh, November or December and then lay in December, 
four months from December should be April and not February. So I'm thinking maybe they mate uh, maybe in September and then they lay and then uh, they mate again in November, December is what mm-hmm. I'm thinking. But we don't know yet. We need to go there and look at them and study them because that would explain the clutches that hatch in February and March. Hmm. And then how we also have hatchlings, hatching size even in the later half of the, in the, in the later part of the year. Yeah. It brings up so many questions in my head as as far as are they multi-clutching or is it possible that, uh, you know, females are laying their eggs in uh, nests that are at different temperatures. So maybe the gestation period for those eggs is longer um you know all these questions of course i hope yeah. you figure out all of them for us back here <laughs> yeah. yeah there's so many questions that we we need to do more research about like yeah. the yeah. incubation period and the temperature and how they correlate it's great on the time though how you're uh, able to utilize all that the data and just plug and play and yeah. see what uh what's i mean i love it, it it's a it's great because you can kind of see. I mean, for for me, I'm what I'm trying to learn with my animals is um, how to how to open that season for them, um, mm-hmm. how to really get them into the gear, and then also how to shut it off. But um, getting into the gears of actually get, getting them to breed and um, successfully laying, and then possibly again and then again, um, man, that's. I've I've always thought it was just a little cycle period or just one go, right? Mm-hmm. But I think what what you've done is opened up a window, and now the whole cycle period is just so long, you know. Yeah. It's like, yeah, it's from for the cool down, the reset, the reset has helped me as well. Mm-hmm. Where, um, like for example, if I just have them going and going and going, I kind of don't know when to expect when to introduce my males right yeah. but they're always together they're gonna breed obviously because you know it's it's that's just what they're gonna do and she's gonna go through the cycle and then he's gonna mount and all that stuff like that but when they're separate this gives me such a better idea on when to introduce males okay. so you know mine will be down and they're now in their period of maintenance where it's light feedings a low humidity the heat is just average it's not piping hot or anything like that and um my animals are at a low right and then when i crank them up and start the reset for their whole season it just opened it up so much where now my animals are double triple clutching i just i had a mangrove monitor drop two clutches in in 60 days that's the fastest for me now um last year last year it was um a little bit i think it was like february and then a uh, not not april but like uh june or july i had another clutch from the same girl but this time it was much sooner and so it was just yeah it's it's kind of it's kind of crazy how i can we're taking what you what you've done with your animals um just because we're able to kind of work it through um, and then doing the same thing because I needed direction with my animals, you know. Um, yeah, it's great we can work together with like that because that's essentially what I'm doing now with everything. I agree. Yeah, learning off of each other. I'm glad we can kind of have this whole uh, platform to do that with because it doesn't matter what you're at or what you're doing as far as, you know, who's had this many years or done this. We can all learn something new. And uh, the Savannah Monitor world is still – unknown in that regard so it's interesting to hear some of this information you're, you're bringing forth um and i'm a little bit jealous that you're you're getting to go out there in the field uh and actually see the animals you work with uh you know that's awesome i wish i could do that for every species um that i keep yeah. and even if it if it doesn't change anything that i i do in captivity obviously because i can't replicate the wild you know, just to get that hands-on experience and at least take in ideas and uh, yeah. see what's going on out there is amazing to me. It's, it's, real, it's a real dedication to everything that you're doing, you know, 
um, from from the ground up. Um, just your surroundings, uh, the, your your background, um, and uh, you know you, you you essentially live it on top of your monitor, Liz. Yeah, you? I live very cramped, and I when I wake up, I can see both the female <laughs> enclosures and the male enclosure uh, nice. when I wake up in my bed. <laughs> Because <laughs> I, I live in the same room as them. Now, um, what was your 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 routine then? Then, like as far as like feeding, um, do you feed quite regularly? As far as now that she's breeding, you're you're kind of just always up to up to date every day, or is it like kind of sparsely? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, now when she's carrying this third clutch, I kind of want to avoid a fourth clutch. So now I'm feeding her a bit less than I did during her previous clutches. But she is also still eating and it has been, I think it's been 25 or 26 days now. But she is huge. Yeah. But I caught her very early this um uh, mating. Uh, she mated as soon as she was receptive this time, day one. So I'm expecting a bit longer gravidity. But um, this time, during this gravidity, I'm feeding her about every or every second day. But uh, she does get quite large meals then. I feed her rats. Even though people say they get fat, and sick and die. I feed them rats and I've no had no issue with it. Yeah. So I feed her rats, I feed her hard boiled eggs, and I feed her uh, cockroaches. That's what and I that's feed it. her. That's it. Yeah. That's a that's a simple uh, yeah, it's a little three combo thing. It's for for me I do this very similar thing. It's I, I mean, I understand people want variety, but I can't fit 20 different items in my freezer. Yeah. I can fit like three or four at the max, you know, and um, I'm just kind of keeping it simple with uh, like chicks, mice, and shrimp and fish. That's, mm -hmm. that's it, you know, and then I have eggs in the refrigerator um, or I'll just buy those for quick use for a day and you know I, that's it that's really it but yeah i couldn't i couldn't picture myself having like a, a ton of different things um yeah there's there's no there's almost no need to it if you can tackle the basics mm -hmm. you know right if you can um, provide all the nutrients they need yeah and your now, animals conditioned from that you you know because what you said you said uh rodents um roaches and egg your overall animal's condition, are you noticing your animals, I guess, obese in any sense? No, they're all very lean and athletic with strong muscles. And they still have that lateral uh, monitor fold. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I don't weigh them that often, but when I do, I compare them uh, like the, the weight to length ratio like their uh, their body weight index, if you compare it to humans. I compare that to the length and weight of wild savannah monitors, because uh, Daniel Bennett made a chart. If they're this big in the wild, they usually weigh this. And so I compare it with what mine weigh, and they are pretty much almost exactly on the curve of what wild savannah monitors weigh at that size. Amazing. I'm so glad you have this information to share. You know, I think there's a lot of us out here that need to hear it. Um, yeah. And we hear a lot of, I'm not even going to say it's, it's wrong or bad information. I think there's multiple ways to accomplish something, but for a lot of keepers out there, if I can uh, sustain an animal optimally with using rodents rather than throwing, you know, uh, I don't know, a hundred roaches at them in a day, uh, which yes, some animals will eat a hundred roaches in a sitting. If you let them, you know, that's much more, um, 
realistic for me than yeah, it's more convenient. More convenient, yeah. yes. And we're talking about captivity, and so I've seen the the posts, the pictures, and you've uh, been out there and done the the studies. You had a part in it, and you've obviously read other studies, including Daniel Bennett's. Um, so you know you're familiar with what they're eating out there in the wild, of course. Yeah, in the wild, they eat uh, in the area that we've been to. Because they have a, very, a big range, but they are with them too. They, the gut contents, uh, when we do stomach flushing, and also when we just find the poop. Because when you pick up a wild savannah it often shits itself because it's so scared. Mm-hmm. We collect the poop <clears throat> and we analyze it. And we find that the bulk of the content that they eat is grasshoppers, crickets, Snails uh, and some frogs, and those uh, I, don't, I can't remember if they're called centipedes or millipedes, but the yeah. the the ones that don't bite you. Yeah, big, the big, big the black, big black millipedes. Yeah. yeah. So this is why um, scorpions as well. Yeah, Which this is, awesome. is why many people in the hobby, um, because of this study, um, many people consider savannas insectivores um when the the real term is um dang it they they eat vertebrates and invertebrates um not just insects so invertebrates cover quite a bit of other huge insects as well I'm sorry, not insects exactly, but bugs like uh, yeah. the millipedes, scorpions, uh, tarantulas, um, snails, and uh, these are honking bugs. They're they're huge compared to <laughs> our, our cricket and our roach. Um, we don't really, other than my grasshoppers, we don't have any huge feeders like that. Um, maybe death heads or some huge cockroaches, but you know those are those aren't as easy to come by. I mean, they take forever to grow. So, okay. um, you know, they're not as readily available. They are yeah. available in the States, but they're just not as readily like, like dubias. And and so they don't compare in, in, in um, nutrients. And so um, now uh, going back to what Alan said a little bit ago with uh, being able to give them um, optimum ability to bask and usage of cage – her cage is not a little four by two by two. Her no, cages, my cages are quite big. Her cage is like a. <laughs> it, looks, it looks, it looks like it's ten by ten by eight or something like that. So yeah, it's it's not small. It is um, a greenhouse for those who yeah, can't see. Yeah. <laughs> it's a big greenhouse inside her room, right? And so, um, you know, this animal gets to run. It gets to move. It gets to dash around and. Yeah, um, it gets to climb. Yeah, it gets to climb and utilize what it's been eating. So uh, I, I just wanted to clarify, we're not trying to debate here. And we really want people to get an understanding on, on diet and, and health and overall aspects. Okay. So what we have are facts. Okay. She's breeding them on this diet. It's working. And so um, we have to, we have to still take that in as those are our key data right now. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, it's not just where she's using insects and having success. And even Dean himself uses chicks and uses yeah. um, uh, rodents as well. Yeah. And he also has very large decked out enclosures where they get to do a whole lot. Okay. Yeah. Now, going back to the diet and health and stuff, if you were to feed them rats and mice and chicks and eggs and then didn't allow them to do any of that stuff, run and climb and and basically scale utilize exercise all that stuff right um these animals are just sit there like blobs and then die that's yeah. that's that's that is true okay and then an, an, an insect diet would essentially be leaner on the animal helping the animal out and essentially keeping it um alive better because it's not really able to exercise so it's not really consuming a whole lot right it's right? not fixing the actual problem I hope yeah. people understand that 
because you might be feeding animals an insect diet, that is great. They can utilize that, but that doesn't necessarily make them healthier. It, there's so right. much more about their overall husbandry that has to be addressed yeah. in the right way. And I find for the most part, monitors across the board are opportunistic feeders. If there's an easy big meal, they're going to go after the easy big meal. It would just make yeah. sense for survival out there. Um, it does not make sense to have animals surviving off of our store-bought crickets, you know? Yeah. Um, and, uh, uh, sorry. Go ahead. I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't want to interrupt you. Oh, no, no, no. It's just, it, it does not make sense. There's nothing yeah. really that can sustain that animal through all the stages of their life uh, yeah. that can be found in a cricket, you know? And this is the whole, you know, breeding aspect, okay? Like um, Dean, um, Linnea, a, a couple other people are using rodents and using chicks and not just using bugs you know they are using insects but that's just a part of a bigger a bigger diet um like uh just relating to myself with my own animals right and um everywhere a lot of people are telling me you know just feed your kimberly's insects and so i did that and it actually failed some of my animals during the time of really uh, of necessity and so when i switched up to uh, rodents and chicks again including those insects as well um it helped me out a lot better for my females to bounce back and actually go through the process um and then same thing with my mangroves everybody tells me that you know um you know they're not they're not mice eaters or you shouldn't feed them mice because it's just going to make them fat and kill them you know, it, it, it'll relate back to not exercising and not being able to get around and move around as well. And so I have the, the one of the best results for my mangroves with using chicks and, and rodents. Um, I mean, as well as like crustaceans and stuff, but I, I've, I've had to up my game with calcium intake as well as uh, as well as everything else. And I, so I, I needed to really up the game for for the, that species, and I was learning what I was doing when people were recommending me to just dust twice a week, or saying that I can over calcify my animals, and I shouldn't, you know, I should only use this much UVB and not use this certain type of calcium, and you know, things like that. Now I just use D3 and UVB, and I use animal uh, or feeder animals that are heavily shelled or high in calcium um, and that's the been my best result to get smooth big pearly white eggs anything prior to that or what i was doing before my eggs were suffering um, they, they'd come out not smooth they'd come out really rough shaped dimpled um, and so you know now i'm getting much better better results linnea is there anything are you using any kind of supplements along with your your feeders? When I feed them insects, I give them D3 and calcium. I do not have UV lighting. I only had it for like the first month of uh, the female's life. Uh, but they've all grown up. They've not shown any signs of MDD. Uh, but I, I think it's mostly because of the rodent diet, because the rodents contains yeah. a, a lot of the different vitamin D3 uh, variations because there's different kinds of D3. Um, yeah. So let's, let's say like, okay, if you as a beginner, and I've seen this happen quite a few times, this uh, subject with supplements, UV, and s insects for savannah monitors okay now here's where it gets really complicated if you're going to recommend somebody to just feed their savannah monitor insects you may want to recommend them also use g3 and also use uvb yeah. that lizard that lizard is now kind of like a bearded dragon okay because of what it's intaking but if you were to feed it Supplement, I mean, supplement D3 and also like uh, animals like mice and other things that contain calcium that 
that now knocks off the necessity to use UVB um, for that Savannah monitor. So I see people confusing people that are beginners telling them not to, you know, it's UVB is a questionable thing still, right? Is it, is it a necessity? Is it not right? So people may take on that whole not necessity factor, plug that in. So they're only using a heat lamp and then also feeding insects. Cause that's what they also told them to do. And then poor usage of calcium supplement. That is a case for disaster essentially. Yeah. If, you're, right. if you're not doing it correctly for your Savannah monitor. Yeah, you um, can make them really sick either with too little calcium and D3 and get metabolic did, disease. Did, 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 did that kind of make did that kind of make sense to you guys? And just how how I saw that complication where you know people are are essentially recommending absolutely the right and wrong, wrong things. Yeah, but I yeah. think the understanding is um, you know we've had multiple talks about it. Obviously, just. Linnea, from a few of your answers, it seems like you've had to go through the same kind of uh, investigation for your own animals about what's being said and the information out there. So yeah, I guess I, I, I want to continue with the D3 and UV. Uh, when you have uh, D3, like uh, pure D3, it's uh, a fat soluble vitamin. And because it's fat soluble, the animals cannot poop it out. It doesn't come out with urates, uh, so it gets. They can have an excess excess of vitamin D three. And if they get excess D three, it can be uh, bad for them, which is why UVB is important if you're using supplements. Because the UVB and the heat together, they can convert the excess D3 into uh, other variations, uh, other isotopes of D3 that are more stable and not dangerous. Hmm. And you could have a whole other podcast on just D3, uh, UVB and calcium. And I really recommend if if you could to invite Frances Baines. She she knows a lot about this stuff because uh, vitamin D three it goes through a cycle within the body of the animal. Where with UVB, if it hits the skin, it creates a sort of pre D three, which later can be converted into D three if the animal needs it. Uh, if you combine it with the heat. But it can mm -hmm. also convert D3 into, uh, I think it goes back into pre-D3. But I'm not too well versed on it, so you should really ask Francis about it, because I don't want to give wrong info. But when I'm writing that down right now. <laughs> if you use supplements <laughs> and you're not using rodents, uh, you really should combine it with UVB lamp. Not just because of the D3 cycle and providing it with the perfect amount of D3, so it's not too much or not too little, but also because reptiles can see UV light. We humans, we have three types uh, of color detectors in our eyes. We can see red, green, and blue. But lizards, they have a fourth one, which enables them to see UV light. Yeah, And if you have UV light in the enclosure, the lizard gains access to more colors to see. Like, it increases the resolution of their worldview. I actually, uh, I have, I have a little, I had a little a theory behind that too, or more so of uh, what I see in my animals. Um, I used to just use a little floodlight, right? And then the rest of the cage would just be lit from that ambient light. Now, in most of my closures, I have it pretty well lit. And they respond much better. I think if you think about it, picture you're a captive, right? And you already hate, you already hate it. Um, and then you're now in a little dark box with a little yeah. light. 
and then there's a guy reaching in and he's just you're so frightened but when there's when i started using uvb and my cages were more lit i would use uvb on the opposite side of the cage the cage is now no longer a dark dark closet or dark little box you know and the animals didn't respond so negatively they would basically be seeing me they they'd have they'd be more perked up um and going back to that uvb thing where you're they're seeing it i've had them wake up in the morning and just go right to the uvb lamp to bask not even do any um heavy heat basking at all um it's kind of weird where you know people think oh they don't really use it or uvb is not needed man i see my animals respond to it you know yeah um, I mean, the yeah. sun does give out both heat and UVB, yeah. and if you see sunlight, there will always be both UVB and warmth in it. And so for the animals, the two things are very connected instinctually. They know that if there's UVB, that place is warm. That's a good place to bask. Yeah. And they have this parietal eye on top of their head, which goes... Uh, it's a special kind of eye. It doesn't have any eyelids. Yeah. It's basically a, a, third, a see-through a scale. Eye. Yeah, a third eye. A see-through scale that's sort of directly connected to the brain <clears throat> that helps them detect UVB and tells them this is a good place to bask because this is where the sunlight is. And it's also, that's why it's recommended to if you use UVB, which there's no reason not to except for monetary reasons uh, because it can be a bit costly to use UVB. But if you use it, you should keep it close to the basking area, like directly in the basking area or directly next to it. So the animal gets the... Bosk like if it wants to get warm, it goes to the UV and that's where it's warm. So it doesn't feel yeah. cold, and then go to a place that is cold, but, oh, it's a UVB, UV there. So yeah. it thinks it's warm, but it really isn't, because if you keep them separate, the animal will still go to the UV, UVB area to bask, because its brain tells it to, to go there. Hmm. So you should keep the UV and the heat light together, and also because of the vitamin D3 cycle, because... They need both UV and heat together to properly have that D3 cycle going on. To properly convert pre-D3 into D3 and back. They need the combination of UV and heat together at the same time. I like it. You're right. We could have a whole... Uh podcast yeah. just talking about how reptiles are using this and not i wouldn't say reptiles but specifically monitors because um, yeah. other reptiles absolutely you need that in there but it has a lot to do with their diet and when we pick apart monitors you know they have uh, a certain ad diet. right yeah. right um i've 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 had to i've had to learn myself because i did it I didn't want to kill my animals. Obviously, people saying you can over D3 or you can over calcify or whatever. And um, I was I was concerned that um, that might have been something that I was doing because um, people were – I wasn't really knowing what everybody's regimen was as far as how much they were using. But some people were using it all the time, like like every feeding. And then I hear people say, I don't use it at all. And they just, they, it just, it's just their current diet and it, it works for them. And um, <clears throat> some people add a whole, a whole bunch of extra calcium to their animals every feeding. Um, I was just, uh, just doing a couple times a week, maybe two to three times a week, if that. And I would only dust the stuff that didn't really have uh, um, heavy bone content. And my eggs would come out like really poorly. And so then I, I asked the gentleman or I, I posted on Be A Walk uh, uh, and essentially asked uh, why my eggs looked like this. You know, like, what am I doing wrong? And so um, 
Uh, a gentleman mm-hmm. asked asked me, or he mentioned, uh, it might be the whole reason that uh, is related to calcium and their intake and and everything like that. And so what I did was just up it. I went from two times a week to every feeding or ninety percent of meals. I might skip a day or something like that where I don't really do it, or um, or if I'm using a bunch of crab and crustaceans, I don't really need to do it. But uh, you know, just uh, I had to learn through error and trial, failing, I mean, from just two to three mangrove females, right? And I would say now 20, 20, 20 clutches. I haven't I haven't hatched 20 clutches. Um, don't, let's not get that confused. But I've had a lot of clutches just dropped and laid. And I can tell just by, you know, how, how, how well the eggs looked. All right, am I doing well or am, am I not doing well? Um, you know, and... Um, I, I can then readjust and and then uh, add more calcium if, if I need to then, because that's a uh, that's what uh, that's what I've been trying to do is just really get better with uh, it being able to have their have their eggs come out well enough, um, not just like dimpled. I, I've I've actually seen that in other other people's stuff as well, like uh, a friend of mine or two two different friends of mine, uh, and they're not even. Um, in the United States, but uh, gentleman Cody in uh, Canada and Kenneth, and I believe Denmark. Um, I'm not. I'm not a hundred percent. Yeah, Kenneth is in Denmark, and um, both had mangrove monitor eggs, and they came out kind of looking wrinkleish. Like it, they're just. It's not smooth and pearly white. It's kind of like dimpled in a way i've had them dimpled where it's almost like craters but this is more like i don't know it's it's just a bunch of little spots and there's they're covering the entire egg or all of the eggs and um you know i'm just really trying to see if uh, this adjustment to them as well will will help them uh get better maybe their gears are just getting into um the flow of things and the animals are are kicking these out because they're the first time eggs really but um you know getting into uh their future clutches i hope this would be a, a little change in in where where they're going with their calcium intake as well um i hope that that gives us an idea on just how much monitors need as far as calcium you know and you know talking about calcium and eggs you have the you had a clutch of 44 what was the yeah. What was the other clutch? How many eggs in the other clutch? The clutch, the second clutch was 28 eggs. But wow. out of those 28, only four looked fertilized. Like, like only four looked good. Okay. The rest, uh, 24, they were like uh, empty sacks. Like, mm-hmm. uh, that's, that's, re- that's weird, right? So what, what, what made it that those didn't connect you know i always wondered that because yeah i wonder it too but i have two ideas or two theories uh the first one being that the males had already been in full dry season for three or four weeks so they had they hadn't eaten for uh, my male who i mated her with hadn't eaten for like a month. And I mentioned earlier that during the dry season in the wild, the testicles of the males yeah. shrink. Shrink. So I'm thinking that it could be a problem with the male that he didn't have viable sperm when he mated with her for the second clutch. The second theory is that they mated too late when the eggs had already begun to calcify and it was hard for the sperm to penetrate the eggs. Hmm. But out of Hmm. those four good-looking eggs, uh, three of them molded within a couple of days in the incubator and only Hmm. one actually started showing veins. One. I've had similar things, um, but now let's, let's go off of just to throw it out there the the first theory if the male uh let's just say wasn't able to get it done that would not, ass- not viable at first as far as sperm right 
Right. Yeah. Or not, or are we talking about <clears throat> missing and being late? Or are we talking about like no, not having viable sperm? We're talking about not having viable sperm. Or, you know, interesting enough, I guess it would work in both theories. If he was too late, but yet you still have one good egg, would that yeah. possibly be parthenogenesis going yeah, on? Yeah, that's what and, I'm wondering too. Um, right. I've been asking a friend who works at the zoo to see if maybe he could find a lab uh, that would be willing to do genetics testing, but it's mm -hmm. going to cost. Yeah, I mean, that's, what they, that's what they always tell me. And I always say, I got the money, but they never come through. <laughs> uh, um, I guess the estimate for US dollar is a couple thousand bucks, give or take. Mm -hmm. uh, whoever's out there listening, I, I have the money and I, I want to do it. I actually have some parthenogenic projects myself and I like to kind of just uh, solidify everything, have it backed up with uh, um, evidence and data. And uh, my I've had now a couple of generations. So yeah, I'd love to, I'd love to really get, get the testing on that, dude. Yeah, to have it on paper. This is a real 100% powerful baby. Right. Yeah. I nice. had uh, last season, I had both a clutch of uh, Acanthus and a clutch of Tristis, where um, I had already had viable clutches from both females before. And I did not witness a whole lot of copulation, if any copulation, that I actually took note of. And to see them go through the cycle again, it wasn't that I wasn't looking. I was just seeing them go through the cycle. The male was in there with them. Uh, so I can't exactly ruled that out but in both of these clutches i ended up with only one good egg out of uh <clears throat> out of both and both of those animals hatched um but it's in the back of my head also was this parthenogenesis you know um yeah how come there's just these one how come the other eggs didn't hit as well like, right yeah you know, yeah and as you may have alluded to you know we we a lot of times we focus on the female as far as cycling and reproductive events and whatnot. But yeah. is there also the side as far as sperm production in the male that we need to be paying attention to? And are we missing that sometimes? And, yeah. uh, you know, it's great to get parthenogenesis going and, and see what that can do, what these animals are capable of. But are we missing a step when we have a male available to the female and we're, we're getting um, these types of clutches? You know, there's just yeah. the questions are... <laughs> That's how that's how I feel a little bit. Um, I'm kind of in the same thing trying to figure out. Um, I guess you can overheat a male and just keep him too hot, mm -hmm. right? And um, uh, it's kind of like where people cool down snakes, yeah, um, and basically bring the uh, eggs in the female and the sperm in the males down and then I, I don't know it just regulates stuff and as they bring them back up um everybody's stimulated right right um i think this is very similar uh where cooling the males down or taking i uh, take taking everybody down um and to a certain temperature where they can either get cool at nighttime or have a cooling period and i've talked to some keepers where they basically are restarting their monitors or restarting giving them a sorry not restarting is not the word a reset on on the cycle you know mm -hmm. um and so they get, basically get a break for a while kind of just maintenance feed and um nothing too crazy but uh this last winter i let my nights go down to 60 um probably a comfortable 63 62 at the lowest, um, maybe a one or two nights where it might have gone like fifty-five or something like that, but I didn't. I, I closed the window then, but um, you know, I actually let some of those enclosures get really cold, um, and then brought all my animals down. And um, you know, I, I I tested something where I used to just think, all right, seventy-five, eighty is the coldest they're gonna ever get at nighttime, you know. Right. And so I would either keep heat on. Um, and or use to utilize something in some way where the cage would be hot um but man it's just uh, now I, I do things way differently where they get to cool down a little bit more at nighttime it's a 
for sure no more 24 7 lighting um unless like the female really needed it and it's just you know it's just a great option to just give her a chance to grow a basket and all that stuff like that and you know, kind of get things going um a little bit faster for her without having to wait for the next morning to roll through but um yeah just uh just just seeing seeing all that man Linnea, do you use uh, 24 hour lighting with your animals? No, because since I, I sleep right next to the horses, <laughs> right. and I need to be able to sleep. Yeah, uh, right. I also don't use 24 hour heating unless it's uh, cold nights. Mm-hmm. Like uh, during the winter, my time, it gets a bit cold. So then I might use um, the heating, but then I use the heating in just the greenhouse. Because it heats up the ambient of the entire room. Nice. So I don't need uh, to keep anything else on, but only during the cold nights. The rest of the year, I turn everything off when I go to sleep. Mm. So the lizard, they get down to maybe like 24 Celsius or something at night, depending on where they chose to sleep. Okay. All right, 20, 24 Celsius is what in Fahrenheit? Oh, I, I, I don't know. Hold, hold on. I'll uh, consult the all-powerful Google here. Uh-huh. and. Uh, <laughs> oh. Yeah, yep, so that's, that's what much. I do. I, I need to be able to sleep, too, and the lizards are able to survive it. Yeah. So about 75 degrees Fahrenheit. At, at 24 degrees Celsius, about 75 degrees Fahrenheit, yeah. or I would say roughly what we consider room temperature. Um, yeah, and it, depending on the temperature outside, it can get even colder than that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's and, o- that's okay. Yeah, you know, like I, there was the male I keep the se- the male who is separate because it doesn't go along with the other males anymore. Uh, when he started fighting with the other males, I didn't have a separate enclosure for him, so he had to just roam the room for a couple of months. And my room temperature then was around 21 or 22 Celsius, and he was able to survive. And uh, I put up a small basking area for him, so he was able to digest the food as well. And he seemed to survive it just fine, and he was able to walk around. He was a bit less active and a bit darker because of his cold, but if he went and basked and was able to continually go back to basking, he was very active as long as he could go back to basking whenever he wanted. Mm. But during the nighttime, I kept the basking light off because I need to sleep. (laughs) Uh, but he survived the night temperatures of uh, 21 Celsius then, so I know they can withstand uh, low cool. 20s. So. Yeah. Now, Linneo, I guess maybe I should have asked this at the beginning, but what was it about Savannah monitors to you? What, what started you in that direction? Well, actually, I was sharing uh, an apartment with someone. And this person was allergic to uh, furry animals. <laughs> and so I started looking into what kind of animals can I keep that aren't furry. And so I found out about reptiles and reptile expos. And I, I wanted a reptile that was easy to maintain, that I could buy food for it from the grocery store. So something that eats like salad or tomatoes. Mm-hmm. So I was thinking of buying a Euromastix, actually. But, and then I went to my first reptile expo, and <laughs> some of the first reptiles I saw was monitor lizards. And it was like, oh my god, is, is, this, even, is this even legal? I thought these were zoo-only animals. I didn't know we could keep them as regular people. Oh, I understand. And then, and then the expo, it's only four hours long. And, and so it was an impulse by when I bought my first Savannah monitor because I was just, I was actually charmed by this other monitor species right next to it, but uh, it was a bit expensive uh, 
uh, upfront price on it for me with the money I had with me to the expo at the time. So I instead chose the budget alternative, budget yeah. within the quotation marks <laughs> of the uh, Savannah monitor right next to it. That's why uh, a fair amount of people get into, you know, savannas and Niles. Don't get me wrong. Um, there are some of these other monitors are, are out there in price. And um, whether it's uh, a, a hype thing or they, they should cost that much. But, you know, these uh, these monitors for for 25 bucks, 30 bucks, 50 bucks, you can mm -hmm. that's that's a typical price of those monitors. And so yeah. they just, they just happen to be um, an easier purchase, you know? Um, and yeah. I think many people can relate to that. And I just want to put this out there for, for those people thinking about getting a monitor for the first, uh, first time. <laughs> this happens a lot, but understand a $20 monitor at a, uh, at an expo, yeah. could end up living in a greenhouse in your room. Yeah. <laughs> there's no such thing as a free puppy. Right. Yeah. yeah, there's uh it, this it's, it'll cost you money and um there it just it's just commitment. I think uh right. 8 by 4 by 4 is like bare minimum, 6 by 3s are bare minimum um type deal and yeah, uh, these lizards just get so big for what they are. You know what yeah, they cost. Like, there, people think they are little cute lizards, but they're they they start that way. They do. Yeah. yeah, they start as super tiny, and then suddenly they're not so tiny anymore. Yeah. Now, as far as your animals and you interacting with them, are they all handleable for you? Yeah, they I I basically live inside their enclosures. Yeah. With, uh, <laughs> Because I they see they see me twenty four seven. I see them twenty four seven. They have no fear of me whatsoever. I can pick them up. I can do whatever I want. I could lift their tail. I could lift their feet. I can touch them however much I want. They don't care. But mm -hmm. um, the the first female, the first my female, is the first one. The the impulse buy at the expo when I I. I just and then you bought, bought three her. more. <laughs> I, I bought three more later. But first I just bought her. And uh, she she was like hatchling size. Mm -hmm. But what? Um, and I took her home. I didn't even know what a terrarium was. I, I didn't know the difference between a terrarium and a pet box. This small plastic thing. Right. And so how, I brought her home. How long ago was that? Like maybe a year or two ago? Because your animals aren't very old, right? Oh, my animals are three years old. Okay, so roughly three years ago, right? Yeah, right. three years ago. So I brought her home in this pet box, yeah. and she was able to. She was willing to hand feed uh, the same day. Yeah. She had no, almost no fear of me. Uh, from day one of me having her. So I was really lucky because that's kind of uh, unusual for hatchlings. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, then a few months later, about two months later, I bought another four savannah monitors. One of them later died, but I bought another four. And these, these were super scared. If I even, if I sat still and they crawled out, like if I just blinked, they would get super scared, run away and hide. If mm -hmm. I breathed, they would get super scared, run away and hide. If I did anything, they would get <laughs> super scared, run away and hide. Um, but because I lived in the same room as them and they saw me, constantly they eventually lost their fear within uh, a month or two yeah that's good i yeah. like i like hearing that it's it's uh, thank you for being honest with how it all started now now of course i'm assuming well i'm assuming you wouldn't recommend that to other people at this time to recommend what exactly Oh, I'm sorry, the impulse buy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, impulse buys, don't do it. 
it's so easy to get in way over your head, especially yeah. with monitors, uh, sort of advanced species that require a lot of money to properly keep. Yeah. If you're willing to make that commitment, you know, mm -hmm. and like really get get into it and kind of go at least uh, at least all all the way, you know, then for sure, um, you know, get your cage set up, things like that. Then kind of go through the right avenues on trying to get one, um, you know, in, in I guess anywhere. Finding captive bred savannah monitors is going to be quite hard. Um, they're far and few in between. Um, so far, most of the breeders are not in America. Right. So, um, you know, um, you'll probably end up with getting a wild caught one. Um, and you, even then, you just want to make sure that the animal's, you know, healthy, alert, things like that. Um, if, you're, if you are going to get one, you know. Yeah. If you are going to get one, I would recommend getting them when they are about hatchling size so that they haven't had time to accumulate problems mm -hmm. and yeah. also try to look at their response. Are they tongue flicking? Look at their, look at their skin, look at their tail, look at their toes. Are they missing any toes? Are they missing the tip of the tail? If you're going to buy one, but please don't impulse buy. But if you're going to buy one, make sure it's a healthy one. Yeah. Because they're, a lot of them, uh, when they go through the exportation process, they are not getting any water, any food at all, maybe not for several weeks. Yeah. And a lot of the babies are dehydrated, very dehydrated. Right. And some have even started losing their toes because of uh, lack of humidity and dehydration during shedding. And, uh, and some also have uh, a few birth defects because the sellers who export and import savannah monitors, they don't really care so much about the health of the animals. They just want to make money. Right. Mm -hmm. So you yeah. have to be very picky with which one you buy. Now, um, when you're uh, keeping the little young ones uh, for the, for the new, uh, for the new beginners that might have gotten their just savannas uh, recently or their Niles recently, how do you keep your little guys? Well, it's been three years since last time, so I'm a <laughs> bit of a beginner again now that these ones are hatching. Yeah, you're going to have about 40. <laughs> how, do you, uh, yeah. how do you plan to house 44? <laughs> yeah, I'm very limited when it comes to space, so... Uh, sadly, I have to fit about 12 in each enclosure, but I hope all, over half of them already have buyers waiting. So Good. hopefully I'll be able to find them new homes before it gets too cramped for them. Right. But what I have set up is a basking area that gets to about 50 Celsius. I think that's about 120 or 130 Fahrenheit. I'm not too sure somewhere around there and I also have some hides and some some rubble they can hide behind but uh, not be completely hidden as well that they can sort of see me but they can yeah. I can also see them when they're walking around so it's not just completely open space and a hide that's completely solid it's, uh, it's a solid hide it's a basking area, and then there's sort of transition with uh, a lot of small stuff like branches and grass and stuff to to be sort of hidden behind. They feel safe, but they can still see me, and I can still see them. Yeah, that's amazing to me because I mean, potentially you've had a second clutch, so there is another egg there, and potentially yeah. a third clutch. Yeah. I mean, this is off of one female, and uh, yeah. in if, one season, it's, yeah. barely been, it's barely been like four months. <laughs> yeah. So one female could potentially put you with over one hundred plus mouths to feed. Yeah. During, that's amazing that to season. me. Oh, that's crazy. <laughs> yeah, that's nuts. <laughs> I'm actually kind of glad I only get three babies. I am too yeah, at this point. 
Yeah. What's on the bits? Uh, you know, when, I, when, uh, when my I, friends show me clutches of like 30 eggs, I'm just like, yo, I'm actually so glad I don't have to feed <laughs> and resell right. all these babies, you know? like. Yeah, I, I a few months ago, I bought just this huge amount of adult dubia to breed to supply these babies with food. Yeah. I, I bought 10 kilos of Oof. adult dubias. That's a lot. So, yeah, and you got to make room of... for those too. Yeah, yeah, but I'm fortunate enough to be part of a, a local exotic animal keeper group. And we have our own locale, our own basement or cellar, where we have some animals and we have space to store animal-related stuff. And we have heating and lights and everything. So that's where I store all my feeders so that I actually have some space left in my apartment. <laughs> um, but yeah, it would be a lot of mouths to feed. And with yeah. 12 in each enclosure, I worry that it would be a bit hard for me to keep track of how every individual is doing. Yeah, because I guess you will. You, you'll just lift up a log. There's going to be a straggler here, and then you'll end up with another little cage for him by himself. <laughs> yeah, maybe. I'm thinking of maybe taking some uh, some water painting and, and just paint a, a, a color or something on the tail, on the scales, because mm -hmm. water painting is rather safe. Yeah. Uh, just so I can distinguish the individuals from each other now that they're babies and they're all very similar looking. And with uh, 12 in a box and three yes, boxes, it's going to be... What I do uh, with multiple babies in an enclosure, um, I put food in different areas as well. Mm -hmm. So I'll have a couple little trays rather than having them all come to one tray. I yeah. realize that that works a little bit better. It's a lot less messy, and um, there's not too much territorial threat or hogging the food or dominance over the food, um, and so they're uh, they're not so much of uh, biting each other or uh, you know harassing the other one. And there's uh, the pecking order, so it kind of alleviates that a little bit. Um, but yeah, you'll you'll get an idea of. Uh, who like the who the who the dominant one in the enclosure? He's walking around real tough, gets bigger, faster, and yeah. he's just he passes at the very top, closest to the lamp, while everybody is in within line. You know, um, yeah. So you'll find those, and maybe you want to how rehouse those first, or mm -hmm. those are the ones that you're gonna move first. Yeah, I mean they will be the ones who are ready to move first because they will yeah. be growing faster. Yeah. But about how soon would you say the dominance behavior starts showing? Mm, right away. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. In some yeah. instances, right away. Right uh, away. Some of what I would do with babies, uh, I would keep whole clutches sometimes together uh, to raise up for a little while. And uh, I would throw feeder bugs in there for them to chase. Usually the more dominant ones would fill up on the feeder bugs. And then uh, following that, right after that, I'd give them a half an hour or so to eat those bugs. I would also place a dish in there with uh, cut up pinks or egg or something for the stragglers who might be a little wary of getting out there in the open um, to also be able to get something into their bodies. So it seemed to work out for me pretty well. There did come a time, of course, where they just needed to be separated and yeah. um, you know, you have to account for those things or I would try to put in dominant animals together. Um, but even then, even then sometimes you, it doesn't work out the best because two dominant animals go head to head. They yeah. don't have that instinct to be, you know, uh, subdominant to the other animal. So just have fun, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Tell yeah, us what you find out. <laughs> yeah, yes. it's me that I could make uh, more enclosures uh, and keep them at my uh, my local reptile group. Mm -hmm. If needed, but uh, I yeah, hope not to need it. But 
Let's see. So, um, are any of them out yet, or they're just pipped? No, but they're all 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 out now. When I checked this morning. Oh wow! Nice. I'll have to look they, for some, they some pictures. They for maybe two or three days. And but I don't see anything hanging from the belly, so I guess it's fully absorbed. Absorbed on yeah. all of them. You just have to uh, wait awesome. for that. You just have to wait for that part to dry. So the, the I just wait for that last bit to dry because that last last bit can still get um, wet bacteria on it and get infected then too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, nice. That's that's great. Amazing. Is there anything, Linnea, that you wanna you wanna bring up or you wanna talk about specific to what you're doing and what you have going on? Um, I I need a minute to think. <laughs> <laughs> no worry. Well, uh, if there's anything owning Savannah Monitor has taught me, it's to be very, very skeptical of what I read and see <laughs> and hear on the internet. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because there is so much contradictory information. You'll find one source saying, never feed them rodents. They will die instantly. Then you have another <laughs> one saying, never feed them rodents. They'll die slowly. And then you have another one saying, feed only rodents because it's the best food ever. Yeah, and then you have another still, one saying, you can do a mix. There's, and then still, you have, there's still people feeding dog food. So Yeah. <laughs> I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't feed uh, parts of an animal uh, to monitors because then they don't get the, the full circle of nutrients. Because animals, uh, most vertebrates, they need the same vitamins in about the same proportions. Mm -hmm. They need proteins, they need fats, they need minerals and vitamins, and they need the same minerals and vitamins. If you feed them just parts of prey, you get just the fat and the protein. You don't get much of the vitamin. Uh, or if you do get vitamins, you only get like iron and only a few of the vitamins instead of getting all of it. Yes. Because you have a lot of the vitamins in the in the bones, the calcium. The brain. Yeah, the, the brain, brain and the internal organs mm -hmm. yeah, the that you're missing out on if you feed them only dog food or filet or chicken legs or whatever. Yeah. So if you're going to feed meat, feed them the entire animal, not just parts of it, because then you're missing out and you're giving your animal uneven access to what it needs. Very good point on that one. Um, you know, something that came up in my mind just as we were talking about how to shut animals off, and this is kind of just a, a side thought. I haven't really tested it, but uh, I wonder if changing up the the food items to maybe – strictly insects at that point would actually trigger that animal to shut it off. I, mean, kind, I hope so. Well, yeah, but kind of to simulate, and this is, uh, <laughs> these are just so, ideas, right? But uh, let's say there's a, there's a, when a season where these animals are eating plenty of food, good nutritious food. And as long as that's going on, they're going to continue to keep breeding and then as yeah. the season changes or maybe it's a migration of um, birds or even just a change in the weather that different animals come out. You know, you might have a, uh, a certain insect. The, everything hatches in a certain season. Well, what's crazy is that I just uh, learned the other day um, one of my friends, uh, his name's Cody. He, he mentioned that uh, vitamin A has uh, a good amount to do with um, – I guess eggs and reproduction. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not I'm not a hundred percent sure of buying that science because I I didn't really look into it yet. But um, he mentioned that the the grasshoppers that I use are very high in vitamin A, and so um, same thing with quail. I guess he mentioned as well, and um, that's really all the insect that I'm currently using, and that's probably why they're just still going at going. <laughs> Maybe I need to use. Uh, roaches and crickets and i don't know but they won't even eat it they turn their noses on because they know what's better you know they, they, right. they know they know what um, they like right yeah. 
Yeah, yeah I, I bet you those store bought crickets will shut that off real quick. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. They don't even go. They don't even turn their heads at it. And so, I've had wild crickets this winter come into my house, populate in my cages, and still like they're not. They're not eating them. <laughs> That's funny. That yeah. is funny. Uh, on the uh, on the topic of the Savannah monitors, though, you had mentioned that the Linnea, you had mentioned that the animals, um, I'm sorry, the female's first clutch, she laid under the basking area, and then... No, she, she, well, do you mean the first fertile clutch, or do you mean the clutch of duds? Well, the I don't first know. The clutch, or the ones that were duds, that were, 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 were me and her met. Okay, um, so... That one was where that was like a year or a year and a half or something ago. Yeah, okay. it was 2019. Yeah. yeah. So that um, was a clutch of duds. That was laid under the basking area? No, it was laid under her home tree that we talked about, her vertical <laughs> upright uh, courses. She laid okay. them under there. Uh, and, but then a year later, now in 2020, uh, that's when she, she dug and laid under some rubble under, or not directly under, but uh, adjacent to the basking area. Mm -hmm. And that's when she laid 44 eggs. And what about the third clutch? The third clutch, uh, uh, the third clutch for this season or the third clutch in total? Because she's still carrying her third clutch for this season. But the third clutch, uh, which is the one she she just laid. Um, All right, that's in total. I I see. I think I misunderstood going through it. So that's why I I, I count the dog clutch as clutch zero, and then the forty-four, it's clutch one for me because it's my first real clutch. Okay. And then the second one is the one with the twenty-eight, and uh, the twenty-eight one is she dug. A tunnel. Her, her tree is adjacent to the basking area. She dug a tunnel that led to the to the root of the tree, to the bottom entrance of the uh, home tree. Uh, so it was adjacent to the basking area. But when she laid this clutch, she went into this tunnel. She started laying underground, and then. Uh, she actually, towards the end of it, she climbed up the tree, which was attached to the uh, tunnel. And she continued laying while inside this vertical cork tube. So they would, the eggs would roll down through the tube hmm. like she was playing mini golf. <laughs> and they would land inside the uh, underground tunnel she made. Okay. Interesting stuff. And, it, and I, it, it really freaked me out when she climbed up the tree because then she took a bit of a break in laying. But she hadn't covered the entrance to the underground tunnel yet. Uh-huh. So I was thinking that she just stopped laying but didn't bother covering the eggs. So I was like, what is going on? Yeah. But scary. then she, con- she continued laying from inside the tree and we rolled down into the tunnel. And then when she was, she actually, it took her so long time to lay all these eggs that she actually slept through the night without laying. And then she continued laying the next day from Mm. inside the tree. And then she went and covered all the eggs. Hmm. Interesting. I I look forward to hearing how, yeah, I look forward to hearing how the, uh, the next clutch goes, but. Yeah. She's yeah. super big right now, so I, I'm kind of, since I only fed her twice uh, after the clutch she laid last time, I'm thinking she should only have uh, developed a few of the ovas, the eggs, since they didn't have much access to food once they started swelling with jaw. But now she is so huge that I'm wondering if maybe it's another 44 clutch. Oh boy. Oh wow. But I guess we'll see once she lays. 
Well, all right, Kai, you have any uh, thing left? We're getting uh, a little long here. Uh, no, I think we, we card a, a ton. Um, man, basically everything back and forth from from natural behavior and the wild and stuff like that um, into diet and breeding. I mean, I guess if there was any other questions that people really had to, you know, um, Savannah monitors, uh, they are able to message us or contact uh, Linnea directly or any of us would be able to help you guys out. Um, but I think we are able to cover a fair amount. Um, I know we didn't get into like, like taming them and stuff like that, but um, I think uh, she covered that quite a bit because she's there with her lizards every day. Yeah, twenty four seven. Working with them every day, and and what that is is it doesn't, it just shows you consistency goes 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 very far with these animals. Um, you know, just a routine type deal. Even so, you can learn them, and then they'll be able to you know work around they're going to work around you but that gives you now an idea on when they're going to be doing stuff and then they're easily more predictable you know right um, but yeah i think i think i think we did a great job i really appreciate you for coming on um and uh taking the time uh we are trying to plan this out for the last few weeks uh and getting it scheduled the right way uh, to be honest i've I kind of suck at time zones, so um, really just had to get it where we're not too sleepy and tired or got to get up for the next day, and also she's not bothered for her day as well. Um, so, yeah, this is uh, this has been great. It's, uh, it's currently 1.18 a.m. in California right now. For yeah, years. and it's uh, 11 a.m. where I am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so... Uh, Good morning, everybody. Yeah, <laughs> yeah good morning. Well, good night for you. I'd love to hear from you again here in the future, um, maybe throughout the year. And as this goes on for you, you know, you come back on, give us an update. Uh, of course, I'll be following. I kind of held off on looking too much into your pictures and what you're doing just because I knew that we wanted to have you on. And so I wanted to hear it straight from you. But, of course, um, wow. Now I'll go and, and check out all the pictures. I've seen a few of them. I did peek a little bit at those babies hatching, but um, yeah, I really had a good time with this. Um, and I'm, I'm, I was really excited about it because I'm also raising a uh, Savannah monitor currently and kind of have a plan with a, a friend of mine to um, take that project on. So, you know, there's, like you said, there's a lot of bad information out there. So I'd rather talk to yeah. somebody that's doing it and and get some good information see what you're doing so i'll be following you yeah well it, it's been it has been an honor to be invited to this podcast and to be able to speak with you the experts oh no 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 <laughs> yeah we're not an experts at all we just uh we're just able to use this platform and like you said earlier um be able to reach people that Right, are, are trying to do well by these animals. I, I think, don't get me wrong. I, I know there's there's you know, there's mm, people that are, aren't, you know, uh, let's just say bad people, right? I mean, <laughs> just uh, they're just horrible with the animals. Not like actual like themselves. They're just um, bad keepers. They, they, they mistreat the animals, right? And you know, there's those people, but for the ones that you know. Um, they just don't know and they have uh, the best intentions and we know there's a ton of you out there um, and we we're hoping that this this uh, conversation and this episode is able to help you guys um, put things together for your current animals um, take some um, perspectives maybe maybe put things together where uh, it didn't make sense before and hopefully things will hook up for you um, this is this is this podcast was able to cover a fair amount and we probably do a part two with uh, uh updates on hatchlings and more so of she's really only into her first season of breeding 
So, yeah. um, you know, when we get into year two and three and, and you're more consistent <laughs> with stuff, we, we definitely have data and, you know, just yeah. things like that. It's the same thing with myself. I'm only into my like third year of hatching Indicus and my second year of, of working with Kimberly's like that. And so, um, you know, it's, there's always new stuff to learn, even if you think you've already, you've already learned a lot and you thought, all right, I hit it. Cause you Brett, you know, you thought you hit it on the nail. Um, because you bred them once or something like that. It's a, uh, it, it's a tricky thing. The second time, like uh, what she was saying, it wasn't so predictable for nesting the second time where her nesting was actual, a very, for me, I, I consider that stressful. Um, you want the female to flow through the whole gravid laying part and coming up part smooth as possible. Um, and uh, you know, it's just, goes to show like what what do we really know you know what are we really doing for these animals and so we want to do better and um it's not that we're failing um we're just uh you know a little stumble here and there getting back up and and working harder trying to figure things out even more um you know fine-tune stuff and uh, i really appreciate you for coming on and being able to um share information back and forth with us because we're able to really use that for just about all our animals and hopefully people can use that for themselves. Yeah, well, it's been very nice to be able to come on to your podcast. Yeah. It's... All right. Well, that concludes the uh, episode five. We hope you guys enjoyed it again. Check out NPR, uh, Morelia Python network.net. Go on and see the different podcasts they have available. I think they just added a new one, uh, specifically, I, I believe it's the Australian Herpeticulture Podcast. I hope that's the whole name. Um, as soon as I get a free second, I'm going to be listening. And uh, among that, among the other podcasts, I mean, they got pretty much everything covered. I don't think there's a a, a tortoise podcast yet, but I know uh, Owen over there. He works with at least one, so uh, maybe that'll start up soon. But, yes, thank you, everybody, for, for keeping with us, for listening. Uh, thank you, Eric, for helping us get this whole thing started and get some of this information out to everybody. For the listeners, please check out the Patreon. If you can help support uh, NPR in any way, that would be great to help get these specific podcasts out to, to different people, people and keepers that are interested in these uh, different wonderful animals. Kai, anything else? No, I just uh, wanted to say thank you, Linnea, for coming on. Um, it, was a, it was a great time having you. Um, you know, just to see everything unfold for the whole project. Um, it's great to see these animals uh, have a different light you know, more, more understanding as we come through the years, I think, uh, as the years go and, and we try new things and, you know, more stuff are coming to light and these animals are, are, are turning out to be more long lived and we understand them a lot more and we're able to produce them in captivity. And, um, yeah, it goes to a lot of, uh, just the private keepers and what we're trying to do. Yeah, um, I, I appreciate the time to be able to talk with you guys. All right. All right. Thank you very much.